Hello and welcome to the Arsenal Ramble. Join us as we delve into the Premier League home clash against Brentford. We'll be discussing match analysis, player performances and the elephant in the room regarding incompetent refereeing. Yet again, I'm your host Dave uh, and as always I'm joined by my co-rambler Dom. How are you mate? Uh, I'm alright but I'm starting to get worried about this... Uh consistent feeling after matches where I'm unhappy. I'm not quite sure what that's about because I've been so used to being, you know, ecstatic after games. But in the last couple of weeks, especially the last three games, the Cup and the last two Prem games, it's just been a meh feeling really, hasn't it? It's uh, underwhelming. Yeah, I'm just so used to just yeah coming on the podcast and just talking about the wins that you almost forget about... (laughs) The downsides of uh, not winning. <laughs> um, but yeah, that's obviously the the third game in a row now where we've we've not won. That's two losses in a draw. Yes, one was in the FA Cup, but um, we're in a, a little bit of a, a rut, aren't we? Um, and it's a strange one because it's one where I don't really know why. You know, there's no there's no real obvious reasons to me anyway. Could you think of anything that's, that's sort of the reason why we might have had this downward spiral? Or no, and and the thing is as well, like we literally have all of our first eleven, apart from maybe Gabriel Jesus, but Enketi has been you know, more than competent since he's come in. So we've we've got all of our main players starting, no injuries, and if anything, we should be stronger because we've strengthened in the January transfer window. So. We're not we're not playing two matches a week. We've been playing one match a week, so you should be uh, fit and fresh for each game. So I honestly yeah. can't put my finger on what is the reasoning for uh, these underwhelming performances. I don't know if maybe it's the calibre of teams that we've been playing, potentially the way that they set up. They might be following that kind of mould that Newcastle set um, uh, in early January. And um, these negative big physical teams they tend to sit back and they really do nullify the way that we we try and play um mm. you know they they just want to counter us really and they, they don't come to win the games they come to try and get a draw so i think that might be a part of it i think sometimes you know when um you've been winning so often uh winning really is a habit so if you if you stop winning, then, you know, it might be hard to get that going again. So that could be yeah. a, another factor, you know, it's confidence and these are all young players at the end of the day. And mm. yeah, it's it's going to be, it, it's hard to expect players of the age of 21, 22 to, you know, just have the know-how and uh, the, the, the all round mindset to be able to just pick themselves up after a defeat or a draw and be like, okay, well, we're going to go again. We're going to win. You know, it's it's going to take time, but yeah, I I can't really put my finger on any real reasoning why we've not come away with wins. Yeah. I think like you say, you probably hit the nail on the head. It's a young team. And, and when you have adversity, they're not used to, to it because they've not had the experience, um, of how to overcome these, these difficult periods and, and we said it didn't we um during the world cup when we had when we went in at that break having only lost one game that you know there's going to be periods where we do lose games and it's how we react to them mm. so yeah I, I think it's just a case of now we've managed to get a draw that's sort of like one step in the right direction it's a point um can we now push on and and, and maybe start to to pick up some some results again um but um going back to the the initial lineup um in the preview podcast we we talked about uh or or contemplated whether we thought arteta maybe would rotate um for this game mainly because we've got the the midweek fixture against man city coming up so we didn't know whether he'd want players more fresh for that fixture um but it, as it turned out, he went pretty full strength, or the the typical eleven that you would expect. Um, I think you you were pretty much expecting that, really, weren't you? Um, was you happy with that eleven? 
Yeah, yeah, I, I was um, I was pretty much expecting him to play his first eleven. I think I said in the uh, preview podcast that if it was up to me, then I would like to maybe rotate a little bit. And um, I yeah. think I even said maybe bring Kivior in for his first start. But mm. you know, I, I, I do think Arteta made the right choice on um, you know if all of your starting eleven players are fit then there's no reason why you shouldn't be starting them. And, and and then only when you start to have injuries and you start to have dips in form, then you should start to uh, rotate your players, so to speak. So, yeah, I, I was I was pretty happy with the, with the uh, first 11 selection. Um, there wasn't any surprises, really. We thought the only real debate could have maybe have been uh, Martinelli or Chossard just because of yeah. Martinelli's dip in form and how Trossard seems to play well when he's come on the pitch. But, yeah, apart from that, um, same as usual. Yeah, just just uh, pretty much standard, really, wasn't it? Mm. OK, so let's get into the, the first half a little bit then. So, obviously, during the games, I like to make little notes, um, just so I can sort of um, remind myself of how, how the game was going. And I've got five minutes, early chance for Brentford, a low-driven cross... Should have done better. Ten minutes. I've got Arsenal get away with another one there. Tony flicks the ball on and Mbuemo goes clear after a Gabriel slip. The ref blows for a foul though. Not sure there was one. So we kind of got away with it. Um, Because I think he did actually, yeah, he put the ball in the back of the net. Although, having said that, Mm -hmm. uh, Ramsdale, you know, he knew the whistle had gone. Yeah. 25 minutes. Yet another let off. Tony hits the bar from a cutback pass. So, 25 minutes in, there's three really, really big chances for Brentford. Mm. Um, despite us having probably about 70% possession. What what was it that that was happening to, for us to concede these massive chances despite having all, all of the ball? What, what was it for you that was causing this? I think maybe it's the overcommittal side of it. So we're really trying to force our way into scoring early because we know that if we do score early in these sorts of games, then it really plays into our hands. We can um, stop the way that these teams like to set up. They want to sit back, they want to absorb all the pressure, play for a draw and then maybe hit on the counter. But yeah. if we, you know, if if we can really put pressure on them from the off and get an early goal, then that, you know, really opens the game up but mm. you do leave yourself exposed when you try and do that if you if you try and overcommit players forwards uh, on the counter and on set pieces and things like that but yeah, yeah I, I think we were quite fortunate really to have not been one or two nil down in in from the first half because you know mm. um, they were really good chances I think the Tony hitting the bar he really should have hit the target he should have buried that to be honest player of his quality yep. Um, I think the the one with uh, Mbwemo in on Saliba, I think that is a foul. I would say it is a foul just because his the, the um, commentator that was on the television. I think he must have been a Brentford supporter. I'm not sure who it was, but <laughs> he, he said uh, as they're watching the replay, they go, "Oh yeah, well, there's a little tug of the shirt, a little tug of the shirt, but that should be enough to um, to pull Saliba down and knock him over." But mm. We know, especially from you know PTSD from Granite Xhaka pulling over Bernardo Silva in the box, any tug of the shirt is seen as a foul. If you if you tug someone's shirt, it is a foul. You're impeding the player. So for Mbwemo to pull Saliba's shirt and he falls over, then it doesn't matter whether it, it's enough force or not. It's a foul. So you know yeah. that's that's a definite no non nothing to me but um yeah apart from that they did have two really decent chances and um we just looked quite sloppy didn't we, we looked sloppy at the back we didn't look mm-hmm. assured really um, and we weren't really what was worrying we weren't really creating too many chances for ourselves mm. that's it we we had all the ball well, not all of it 70% of it um but we weren't doing anything with it uh, mm. a little bit similar in with the Everton game really wasn't it where we're playing that horseshoe football where the ball the ball's going from left to right to left to right not no real penetration into their box um, and as we know Eddie and Ketty is a fox in the box type player so he's not going to really come too short and receive that ball like like a Jesus would so there's no chaos factor there so they they take out um, Eddie and Martinelli by marking them 
we haven't really got an anything to 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 get us to get, to get to get us in there essentially it was just um nullified like you say um and i think we were slightly sharper with regards to passing um as opposed to the everton game we were moving it around a little bit quicker but there was it was just like the final third, the final pass was missing. Um, there's quite a few uh, scenarios. The, the one that sticks out in my mind most, and I can't remember whether it was the first or second half actually, um, but it was it was Inchenko driving with the ball, and all he had to do was sort of play a through ball to Martinelli, who was essentially running alongside him, and he just kept hold of it and hold of it and hold of it until either Martinelli ran offside or or the chance had gone and it had been pressed and tackled. So. And there was quite a lot of scenarios like that where we were just too sloppy on that final pass or that the waiting of a pass or just little little details like that, just that sharpness level um, that really let us down. And yeah, I think um, we certainly were living on the edge. And you'd have to say we we probably got away with one at, at, at the half time. And and again, like in that Everton game, we were probably happy to go in at nil nil. Oh yeah, yeah, absolutely. I was happy to go in at nil nil just because of the quality of chances that they'd already had and the lack of chances that we had had. But um, yeah, it's interesting you say that. It it just seems like there there wasn't really a, a freshness and alertness with the front three. That like the chemistry wasn't quite there, and because of how much build up goes up goes through players like Zinchenko, it, it was disappointing to see him hold on to the ball a bit too long. It, I love Zinchenko and I love everything that he brings to the team. and he's, he's such a quality technician, but he does sometimes seem to overthink it to the point where he wants to make that perfect pass or he wants to make the perfect delivery. But in doing that, he delays slightly and then the opportunity is missed. Yeah. So that is a, a slight flaw to his game. I, I think because he's such a confident player as well, he he backs his own ability, but then he's less he's more reluc reluctant to, uh, you know, do a little give and go with Martinelli. He wants mm. to have the ball at his feet and put a delivery in or something like that. But it's like sometimes you just need to, you know, keep passing and moving, passing and moving, and then these spaces will open up and then you can play the ball in. But yeah, it was a bit frustrating, but happy to be in at half time at nil nil. And I thought Mikel Arteta was gonna put a firework up the bottoms and send them back out and <laughs> we were going to blow them away in the second half. I genuinely thought that was what was going to happen. Yeah. But as we saw, mm. it was a bit a bit of a, a bit the same when we first came out, wasn't it? Yeah. It's interesting what you say about um, Tinchenko as well, because I noticed that he was really overplaying things and he was even trying like little little bits of skill as well. I don't know if you mm. noticed that. He was trying like yeah. little step overs and that, like on the edge of the box. And, and it was just... It didn't really work. It just slowed things down too much. Um, and yeah, it's hard because a lot of our play does go through him in, in the middle. But it was just not his day, was it really? It just everything he did just didn't quite work. And then towards the end of the game, he was just taking random shots on goal from stupid yeah. distances. And it was just like, he sort of like lost his head in, in a way. He... he, he he was getting so frustrated that he just wasn't playing his normal game. Yeah. Probably, probably one of his worst performances in a Arsenal shirt, would you say? Yeah, yeah, I'd agree. And I think he did the whole shots from outside the box in the Everton game as well. Uh, I'm, I'm yeah. pretty certain it, it gets yeah. it gets to a certain point where it's like he gets frustrated and he he wants to try too hard and. He had one decent shot, to be fair, in this game where Whiskered just passed the post. And you think, to be fair, like if, if nothing mm. is happening, then maybe you've got an opportunity for a shot. But it's not always the best option. If you've got players of decent quality around you, like Trossard and like Saka, and they, they can beat a player and put a cross in, as we saw in the second half, then you know it's better to keep passing and moving than, than to just take these random pot shots. But mm. yeah, <clears throat> I think it was probably one of his weakest performances so far. Yeah. So, yeah, a bit of a one-dimensional first half where we really struggled to, to break down that Brighton, uh, Brighton? Brentford defence. <laughs> um, so, like you say, we went in at half-time. We were expecting a bit of a 
bit of a, a, a you know a solid team talk from Arteta, sticking a rocket rocket up their asses like you say, um, and to a degree when we first came out there was a little bit of a boost. Um, mm. I've got in my notes here that on 47 minutes in, a good effort from Saka trying to catch Raya out at his uh, near post. That was a solid little effort I think to to sort of set that tone, um, and we did sort of start creating a little bit more. And there's no real clear clear chances or even half chances but we were starting to show signs and promise mm. that maybe there will be a potential to get a goal um, <clears throat> but then on 55 yet another really big chance for Brentford um, where Ivan Tony narrowly misses uh, with Saliba unable to clear his lines it was one of those sort of bouncing the area type situations uh, so although we were starting to come into the game a little bit more. We were still just had that sloppiness about us that meant that whenever Bright, uh, Brentford got into uh, any sort of pos- uh, area within our, our final third, that they were creating chances out of it. And it was just like, what what could we do to to to, to stop this from happening? I, I couldn't really, I couldn't really put my finger on it. I couldn't really figure out what what was going wrong with that because the. These these errors were happening more and more uh, throughout this second half, and Partey was giving the ball away in dangerous situations. And yeah, I just um, mm. it was just really really unusual. Um, yeah, it's yeah. it's it's like a snowball effect, isn't it? Sometimes where you know, it, or like a domino effect, so to speak, where if one player starts to underperform, then all the players around them start yeah. to underperform, and because all of our team is so reliant on whoever's around them then it just starts to collapse, doesn't it? So yeah. if, if for example, Partey starts to play a few sloppy passes, he's so integral to the way we set up. And then, you know, things just start to break down. Um, and, you know, Saliba, he's been so good, so dominant this season. But since the World Cup, he's had a few dodgy games and this is definitely one of them. He, he was... Uh, um, I think he just seemed to look out-muscled against... Ivan Tony and Ivan Tony, he's a big guy as well. But Saliba should definitely be able to outmuscle someone like Ivan Tony. He should be, or at least, not look completely outmuscled by him. Yeah. It was just you don't know, really know where where to look with that. But yeah, I, I, I get what you're saying. I, I, it's just one of those things where you don't know how to fix it when things are starting to go wrong in that situation. Yeah. You, you, you're thinking. Do we make a change? Do we try and uh, make it ha- like change the system? But I think mm. Arteta did decide to make a change, didn't he? And he um, he changed Martinelli for Trossard. And yeah. shortly afterwards, uh, one of our first match events, um, well, <laughs> first decent chances, the ball gets played to Bukayo Saka, who then uh skips past a player on the right hand side and drills it into the back stick where Trossard's waiting just to tap it in. Yeah. And at this point you're thinking, Oh, happy days, you know, we've scored yeah. and that's it. Like this is what we're waiting for and uh, we should be able to just see the game out now. It was a uh, yeah, mm. it was actually a really, really quality bit of play from our team. And um yeah, yeah, what were your thoughts on that? Uh, well, yeah, brilliant work from Saka, really, wasn't it? To beat his man, to be able to get that cross, um, or that low-driven cross. Um, but I would say it was actually a harder finish than than it, it looked because mm. it was absolutely whipped in with a lot of pace, wasn't it? To, to make sure there was no interceptions on it, and it, and there's quite it's quite an acute angle as well. So to to stab it away like yeah, Trussard did. With you know, with that amount of pressure in the game, because let's be honest, there was very few chances. So this was a golden opportunity to to take the lead in the game, and and one that he he took. And I am so so happy for Trossard actually, because these performances that he's put in off the bench have been warranting of a starting place, in my opinion. And and in the preview pod, I did say I, I was I was hoping that Trossard would start, and I think if he had a started, we'd have probably had a lot more a lot more luck in that first half. Um, he he just looked miles fresher and, and it just looked like there was so much more chaos being created when Trossard was on the pitch as opposed to Martinelli. And it's unusual saying that because Martinelli is that sort of player that he, he, he's very direct and he'll he, he looks to take on players and and um 
you know, get to the byline and cut in uh, crosses to the back post. And that's exactly what Trossard's doing and exactly what Martinelli's not doing at the minute. I don't really... Again, it's something that I really can't put my finger on. Why? I, I just... Uh, well, we've mentioned the Jesus link-up play before, and that is obviously part of it. But um, Martinelli's form has dipped massively. Uh, and I think for me, this is now where we need to rely on Trossard because he's proven now with this goal and, and his performances um, that I think he should be starting. Because, um, yeah, it was a, it was a really well-taken goal. Yeah, yeah, and as you say, it wasn't as easy as it looked. Um, no. And yeah, I, I do think there's definitely a case for Trossard to be starting on Wednesday. Actually, for me, um, yeah. he's he's definitely shown his worth, and I think maybe apart from Saka, he has been our best player in the last few games, or since he's signed. To be honest, I think he's actually been one of our top three players in the team, uh, and that's with him not playing. 90 minutes of every game it's just from his cameo appearances and the time that he's come from the bench so there's definitely a case for him to uh, to be starting or um, at least getting a lot more minutes in this team and I guess that's a, a uh, silver lining that we could take from this match um, but yeah it, he uh, I, I was really happy for him as well to be honest because I, I do think his recent performances definitely warrant a goal and uh, mm. to see him get his first goal there you can see how buzzing he was with it as well. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah doing his little celebration. Yeah. And so less than less than ten minutes later, um, there's there's this situation where we're unable to deal with this set piece. Um, the balls jiggle around in the box. Eventually, it spills out um, and gets nodded home via Ivan Tony. Seemed inevitable, really, didn't it? Um, <laughs> so, so obviously, before talking about the the VAR issue, it, let, let's try and talk about it. Just forgetting that. So, yeah, it's, it it frustrates me that, like, like you mentioned it earlier, we've got Saliba and Gabriel in the box, the absolute powerhouses, and I know Ivan Tony is an absolute beast in the air and so is Mwepo to be fair to him but we're just not dealing with that ball are we in our area um, and we've seen it in recent games normally we like we, we had hardly conceded any headed goals all season and now we're conceding them um, every mm-hmm. other game at this rate and it, it seems like how we defend set pieces has changed massively what we tend to do is have some form of hybrid where it's sort of half zonal, half man on man, don't we? But whatever, whatever we've changed is not working. Or maybe it's a fact that teams are finding out ways to exploit that hybrid um, defensive system. But um, it just seemed like every second ball in this game we were second best at. Does that make sense? We just, yeah. I don't, I don't understand. Why? Yeah, because like you say, Saliba is a, is a man mountain, isn't he? Uh, and he is no <laughs> slouch at, 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 um, competing for balls in the air. Same with Gabriel. So I just don't understand how we were second best almost every single time. Um, so yeah. Was... I just, yeah, I completely agree with you there. And uh, going back to the goal, it, it's there's two or three decent opportunities for us to clear that ball. And as you say, the ball bounced around. It got headed about three or four times in our box. And every mm. time it was a Brentford player that was winning the ball, uh, they were yeah. getting getting over the top of our players. It, not even the fact that they were like just getting to it. They were completely, you know, rising like a salmon over the top of players <laughs> like Saliba and Gabriel. And you, you think, why are they not challenging for it? Or why are they not putting them yeah. off or dragging them down or... Yeah, we're not dragging them down to give a penalty, right? a penalty away, but you know, just to at least put them off. Yeah. But you, you think when even before all the offside and all of the controversy, that was such a sloppy schoolboy error goal to concede. You know, like a top level Premier League team shouldn't have a ball floated into the box from. Let's face it, it wasn't even a corner; it was just a, a free kick that was won in our final third. A, a ball floated into the box. 
pinballed about up and down to the back stick and then just squared across to Tony, who was also unmarked at the back. It's just ludicrous, the fact that we conceded that goal in the first place. And it does really gripe me that we're starting to concede from these set pieces. And the yeah. the Everton game was the same when, uh, you know, we, we had two small men on Tarkovsky. And I, I think it's a bit of both. I think teams are starting to cotton on to the way that we defend these set pieces, especially if their team is designed, you know, if they're a set piece specialist team, they're going to mm. look to isolate our less physical players, so to speak. And, you know, uh, well, even our more physical players, as you say, Saliba and Gabriel, they're not being physical. So, I mean, it doesn't matter who they try and isolate, I guess, but yeah, it's, it is really frustrating. And, um, yeah, before we even talk about the offsides, it's just something that we've got to highlight, the fact that we should have been dealing with that. Yeah, yeah. Okay, let, let's let's talk about the, the decision then, because well, we're recording this um, Sunday evening, and, and since time has elapsed, since that full-time whistle, more information's come out around the... Um, the PGMOL essentially, um, mm. and they've accepted the fact that Lee Mesa did not fully investigate um, the Norgard offside, uh, and the reason why they didn't fully investigate it was because they didn't draw the lines. They didn't. They didn't. <laughs> they just didn't. Well, they forgot. <laughs> but um, I got a minute. Obviously, the they've usual got, process. They've got one job. That is literally their one job on every single goal decision that goes in. You look to see if it's offside. And how do you see if it's offside? You draw the lines. And yeah. he's not done that. Why has he not done that? It's just infuriating. And it really, really does bug me the fact that they, it, when we're watching the replays and they're looking at the VAR review, they were double checking, triple checking whether Gabriel was impeded right at the start. Um, yeah, uh, and they were focusing on that, but they didn't actually mm. look at all at the, the last pass, well, the second to last pass before the actual goal was scored. And it's it's yeah. like, why are you not checking that? That's like the most important part of the whole play. The whole phase of play is that last ball getting played in for him to then you know square it to Tony. Mm. And they didn't even check it. They didn't even draw the lines. It's it's just so poor. How can <laughs> how can referees be allowed to just be like? Oh yeah, well, the reason I didn't do my job is because I I, um, I didn't check. I forgot. I forgot yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's mental. And obviously, I mentioned that it's Lee Mason. Guess who was uh, responsible for the error in the Manchester United game where Martinelli scored, and they deemed that it was Odegaard fouling. Oh, Gary Neville. Oh, no, he's there now. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I hate to be with this conspiracy guy, but. This absolutely stinks or something. Absolutely mm. stinks. Um, PGMOL can confirm its chief refereeing officer, Howard Webb, has contacted both Arsenal and Bright Brighton and Hove Albion this weekend because they've also had another a controversial um, decision in their game against Crystal Palace. Uh, and they've, they've essentially explained to, to Arsenal that there were significant errors um, in that VAR process. And... Um, essentially issued an apology but apology doesn't get you those two points back that we've lost yeah. out on it's, yeah. it, it, it lost us out on three points against Man United potentially um, yeah, it, yeah. It, and that's, it really... that's the difference though isn't it like like you say that's, that's four points potentially so if we were to lose the title by any more than four points or any less than four points sorry then that's literally down to refereeing incompetence and it, it's just it's so annoying it's so frustrating and the, the thing is when before VAR you would have these decisions sometimes they were a bit dodgy or whatever but it was swings and roundabouts you know that mm. at some point in the season you would get a controversial decision and it would kind of cancel it out whereas we don't really see too much of that with VAR it kind of it's almost like it targets certain teams because of whoever's actually adjudicating it. And without going too much into the whole conspiracy theory, it does feel like there's a kind of like an agenda towards certain teams and other teams are getting better decisions, so to speak. But I, yeah. I, 
I really don't like Chelsea and I I don't want to give them any sympathy at all. But the decision in their game, the handball decision, which wasn't was wasn't given, sorry, that is yeah. Unreal. That is outrageous. How have they not given a handball for that? Like, I was obviously happy that Chelsea didn't get a penalty to win the game because, you know, Chelsea mm. can get relegated for all I care. But that just shows the standards of refereeing in our, and shows the standards of VAR in in this mm. league. It's just, in, it's in the bin, isn't it, really? Yeah. And and they've they've confirmed that they haven't actually issued an apology to Chelsea for that decision. <laughs> what? Because it wasn't, it, because it wasn't clear and obvious. Well, it kind of was, but this this uh, whole offside rule is black and white, so that's where it becomes clear and obvious. Mm. You know, it's either onside or offside, essentially. And obviously, they didn't draw the lines, and if they had, they would have seen it was offside. <laughs> Hence, why they've issued the the statement and apology. Um, but we've said it we've said it millions of times, and I don't want to bang on about it. But this is the problem with with VAR. Um, it's meant to be there as a safety net to get these decisions right, the clear and obvious ones anyway. And even then it fails. So what is the point? Like, what is the actual point? Um, yeah. And then, and then even honestly, like, so you say like, sometimes I, I quite liked the fact that you didn't have to wait for a decision as well. Like you'd score a goal and then you look to the linesman if it wasn't mm. flagged off, then you just celebrate straight away. Like you, you don't yeah. have to think, oh, was I onside? Was I offside? Is this? That was part of the beauty of football that you'd score, and then sometimes you'd look at it in retrospect, but oh, we got away with one there, or yeah. you'd look and be like, oh, what? They should they should have been ruled out or whatever. But you know that it's going to come back around. But yeah, it, it takes yeah. the emotion out of football. It takes the edge off winning if you do win and it's like a, a goal decision because you don't want to celebrate and and yeah. then when they get decisions wrong it just makes you think well what's what's the bloody point of even having it in the first place yeah no it's uh yeah it's really really frustrating um but you know if i were to take a different view at it in my opinion we didn't really deserve three points in this game um I would have no. liked to have the three points, obviously. <laughs> um, but we didn't show enough, did we? So, respectively, I would probably say a point each is reflective of how the game went. But, you know, that, that's not how football works sometimes. Sometimes you you uh, you can grab a goal like we did. It was probably our best chance of the, and only chance of the game, really, that was warranting of a of a of, of a goal and the only way they were scoring really was either us making a really bad error or a set mm. piece obviously that's how they got their goal um but you know had VAR worked we probably would be celebrating three points right now um and would be yeah. much less glum cuz uh yeah, it really does hurt a little bit um so so yeah, I mean, I haven't really got too much more for the rest of that half. Really, we we did push for that extra goal. I think we we made some changes. We brought Vieira on for for Xhaka, which is a substitution that I've been sort of wanting to see a little bit more because we mm. are always making these like for like substitutions, like Tommy Asu for Ben White or Trossard for Martinelli. But when are we ever putting someone on to sort of add that extra attacker, for example? So Vieira's obviously a bit more creative and. Um, plays a little bit higher up than Xhaka so I was I was happy to see that but he, he didn't really I mean I, I know it wasn't a tremendous amount of time but I didn't really see too much from Vieira in fact one of the most disappointing things that I saw came from Vieira and it was in the dying seconds of the game last oh. kick of the game we had a really dangerous free kick and what does he do just basically kicks it out of play on the back stick and it's like God's sake like this is what I was talking about with these final little details, that final third pass, that, mm. you know, we just were not at it, were we? With that, the sharpness was, was real low, real frustrating. Yeah, it, it, it did kind of look like we'd given up by that point, didn't it? And and yeah. we we'd already had a few of those Zinchenko long ranges, and then that ball in, you know, the last chance of the game. You're thinking, just you've got one job, just stick it in a mixer. And then hopefully something can happen, you know. Hopefully there was like a carbon copy of the Brentford goal, you know. That could happen. Yeah. So just get it, get it in there, 
<laughs> and that's all you've got to do, Vieira. You're a professional footballer. You've got to kick the ball 30 yards or so into one area. And there's about 10 of your players there. Just anything. But no, mm. no, it, it was straight straight to the keeper. And it was, you know, final whistle. And, it was, and as you say, yeah, we didn't really deserve to win that game. But in football, you don't always get what you deserve. So, you know, yeah. it's frustrating because we should have nicked it so to speak. We should have, if VAR VAR worked, we should have, you know, but it didn't. And we finished the game and we, I think we should be happy with a point because we could have quite easily lost that game. I think we, we definitely shouldn't have lost to Everton. That should never happen. That was an absolute blip, you know, Um, but Brentford, they're a good team. They are, you've got to give them credit. They are a good team. The top half of the table, they've beaten some big teams this season and they gave us a good game and they could have scored quite a few today. So to come out of that game with a point, in retrospect, you know, when the dust has settled, I feel like it probably was a point gained, you know. But yeah, um, yeah fingers crossed, this is the end of our rocky patch. And yeah. what a way to go... <laughs> end the rocky patch if we did end up going into our next game and uh, maybe turning that team over but so man city they have just played today and i think they've turned over uh, who are they playing today villa villa wasn't it 3-1 i think they uh, unfortunately yeah. and man united have won as well so we don't have the luxury that we did last weekend where when we do make a mistake and we do trip up, the other teams also tripped up with us. Now, yeah. it didn't seem as, as bad of a mistake then. But, you know, we drew today and then the other teams have won. So they've both gained two points on us. That yeah. This is something which we need to watch out for. We need to be looking over our shoulders and saying we really do need to start to kick on and uh, get maximum points from these matches. Yeah. Yeah, ground has been gained, um, essentially. So that makes the the game even more pressurised on Wednesday, doesn't it? Yeah. It's it's huge, isn't it? It's absolutely huge. We've got a game in hand on Man City. But if we were to lose that game, we then go level on points. (sighs) And then then our title charge becomes, well, we're not favourites anymore because we're on the same points as City. You know, we're already probably not favourites in in a lot of people's eyes anyway. Yeah. so this game this game is absolutely huge it can mm-hmm. abs- it's going to make or break one of these teams i think you know hypothetic hypothetically if we win it the confidence levels is going to absolutely skyrocket you'd imagine um and will help us kick on with these with these next games because as we've mentioned in previously we've got a, a nice run of home games that are all quite winnable um so not only would we have the confidence from from beating the last year's Premier League winners we've got the um we've got the the favorable fixtures so it, it yeah. it's huge it's huge um yeah i, well, I would not for it <laughs> um no to be honest, if you'd have asked me, if you'd have asked me two weeks ago, I would have said, "Yeah, right up for it. We will get at them. We're playing at home. You know, we should give them a really good game and give them, give them the game that we should have given them last season, um, where we unfortunately ended up, you know, losing the game in the dying seconds of the match, where Gabriel yeah. got sent off at the Emirates. We we really could have won that game, um, and." If you'd have asked me a few weeks ago, I, th- I think we would have outperformed uh, ourselves on that game. But no, I am not confident at all. Uh, <laughs> and it's one of the first times this season I've not been confident going into a match. And I think the whole it being at home thing before the Brentford game, I would have said, well, you know, we lost to Everton away, but that's good as some park. It's our bogey ground. It can happen. But the fact that we drop points against, well, we drop points against Newcastle, and then drop points against Brentford at home. Mm. It's it our, the Emirates isn't as much of a fortress as it has been, you know, in the last few months. So mm. I am worried. And the the only saving grace for me 
is knowing that City aren't going to set up the same way as Everton, the same way as Newcastle, the same as Brentford. They're not going to sit back. They're not going to be this big dominating physical team which is going to rely on a set piece to try and, you know, um, fly into the box and bully our players. They're, they're a technical team like us. So if we can out outplay them, really, if, we, if our technical ability is better than their technical ability, then we've definitely got a chance. And fingers yeah. crossed, we'll... Uh, we should be able to get a result there. Um, also, I hope that Arteta doesn't start Rob Holding against Haaland again because, as we saw in the cup, that was not a good idea. Um, <laughs> so we don't we don't want that. We don't want that at all. No, no, no. You took the words right out of my mouth. To be honest, um, with regards to the way that they set up, it might actually benefit us and allow us to play our game a little bit more and. And you know, start getting Odegaard on the ball a bit more and, and get his creative sparks flowing again because we've not seen that. Um, yeah, I think I'm not confident. Yeah, like you say, I'm not confident because how can you be? You know, in this little rut that we're in. Um, so, but having said that, if we can, if we could even get a draw, you know, mm. if we could even get that, then it's not the end of the world for me. We're no worse or, worse or off, and we're a game closer. Um, yeah, I think I, I don't know. I've just got this funny feeling. It's, it's based on nothing, to be honest. But I've got a funny <laughs> feeling that we're going to turn up <laughs> and um, sort of just you know put this rut behind us and hopefully make a little bit of a statement in this game. I, I don't know. I've just got this feeling. You are ever the optimist, Dave, um, and I, I admire your optimism, but. Um, for me, I just, I just don't know. I, I really want to agree with you, and I really hope that we do end up doing that. Um, but as you say, if you ask, well, if you ask me, and I think if you ask a lot of Arsenal fans, would you take a draw pre-game? I think most people would, just because it's that fear of losing. You know, it's, it is definitely a six-pointer. If you do lose, you know, they've won, you've lost. <sighs> to be level on points with City going into this you know final few months of the season you just think they're gonna just steamroll this now especially the it's the psychological aspect of being eight points clear at one point and then being dragged all the way back to being level on points even though they've got another game yeah. played you're then looking at the table thinking they've called us back eight points you know we had this gap and now there's no gap so you know, i really hope that we can turn up and, and to be honest I will be in dreamland if we do end up winning because that would put us six points clear and going into that run you'd hope that we should get I think the next mm. nine games or so are these winnable games so to speak I mean obviously the last two were meant to yeah. be winnable games but there's no <laughs> there's no easy winnable game in the Premier League but the next nine games um, we should be taking a lot of points from so mm. yeah yeah fingers crossed uh, on Wednesday yeah, I just wish we had we had Jesus available for this game because yeah. you've got that little you've got that ex city thing. You know, all all ex players want to perform against their old club, especially because he was not favoured. You know, over so many other players. You know, probably rightly so with Aguero and players like that. But he's got mm. that little little point point to prove, and I just wish we had him. Um, not only that, but I just I just love the link up play that. That he has and it causes so much chaos and and the the chance creation stats compa compared to when he was in the team to now with Eddie in the team is just mental and and the football that we were playing it was just not only were we winning more games but it was so much so much more entertaining wasn't it um really do you think do. do you think Jesus could have been the difference against Brentford do you think he would have 100%. yeah Hundred percent, yeah. Um, again, this is probably one of Eddie's worst performances in in the last well since he's been in the team. I would say he, his final pass was sloppy every time. He's making wrong decisions, um, weren't linking the play really that effectively. Um, yeah, this these sorts. Not only is Jesus an absolute beast for big games because of his energy and his his ability to to press um defenders 
he's also a beast in these games where they are going to play a low block against you and you've got to break them down and you've got to you've just got to have something magical you know like that, that um that just that little that little chaos factor that can just create something out of nothing i think that's what you need we needed in that game and i think we were probably looking to to martinelli and saka at providing that but at the minute that's just not coming so I, yeah i do think jesus is going to be massive for for yeah. these la- latter games that he'll be available for Exactly, and, and he's going to be like a new signing as well when he comes back. And <clears throat> I think we're going to have a real morale boost when he comes back into the fold. So that's something for us to get excited about. You know, it's it's not all doom and gloom. You, when uh, mm. when we do get Jesus back, we're going to have an extra quality striker who, when we're struggling to get goals, he's going to turn up. So, you know, that, that's at least a positive note. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Okay, well... I think that is pretty much it for the game. Um, obviously, not the, the the best result to to talk about, but um, I think we've got the, the the meat and the meat of it. Is there anything else that you, you'd like to talk about, or, or that we've missed? No, not really. I think you, you, we've we've picked apart a game which was quite disappointed, really. But yeah, you know. Yeah. I, th- I think we've got another point on the board and uh, we move on to the next game. Yeah, exactly. Um, okay, um, so that's going to conclude another episode of uh, the Arsenal Ramble. Uh, we hope you enjoy the show. Um, and don't forget to tune in for the uh, for the City game because we're going to do a preview podcast for that and then we're going to do one on, I think, probably, probably the Wednesday evening as well, straight after the show. Um, so don't forget to, to tune in for that. Um, if you've got any comments or suggestions, feel free to, to reach out to us on Twitter. We're, uh, you can reach us at, at ArsenalRamble underscore. Uh, and if you're listening to, to us on Apple Podcasts, uh, that's the only platform you can essentially write a review uh, for the podcast for. So if you could, cons- could consider writing us a review on there, we'd massively appreciate it. But that's it for now. Thank you, guys. Take care. Catch you next time. <laughs>